Okay. So um, today we are going to essentially continue with Streamlit and specifically we will talk about the Leibniz proof. Last time we proved consistency. Okay, so first, uh, let me quickly remind you what the protocol is and we'll quickly recall what we learned in the last lecture, right? So Streamlit is a blockchain protocol. Uh, it follows a proposed vote paradigm. Essentially, you know, it goes uh, by epochs. Every epoch, uh, the leader of the epoch will propose a block by extending the longest notarized chain it has observed. And then everyone will vote for the proposed block as long as the proposed block extends from one of the longest notarized chains I've seen. And then if the block collects votes from two thirds of the people, it becomes notarized. Okay, so then um, that's the protocol. And then to finalize blocks, uh, you, you are looking for three uh, blocks with consecutive epoch numbers appearing together in a notarized chain. And if you find this good pattern, essentially three consecutive epochs, you chop off the last one and the entire prefix is final. Okay, so the last time we went over the consistency proof and we uh, concluded that, you know, the consistency proof actually doesn't depend on network timing. Like no matter how bad the network is partitioned, even if people uh, cannot talk to each other for a long time, it doesn't matter. Consistency always holds. Okay. So of course, uh, let's say if the network is partitioned and you know, people are there in separate islands, they cannot reach each other, then in these circumstances, we cannot guarantee liveness. So today we are going to learn about the liveness theorem and in the Leibniz theorem, we do need um, some condition on the network timing. So essentially the idea is, you know, whenever uh, the network condition becomes good again, right? Let's say, you know, honest players can uh, talk to each other within a single second. Uh, remember a second is like an epoch length, right? So we, we, need to make, we need to be able to make a round trip within a second, which means I send message to Jinxi and Jinxi responds to me and that round trip um, takes place in a second. And essentially under such good network conditions, we can guarantee progress or guarantee liveness. Uh, and typically we call, uh, you know, a period with good network conditions, a period of synchrony. Okay, but and also it's also called global st uh, stabilization time. So what is global stabilization time? This is a way to model the time at which the networks become good. So it, it can be, you know, your, your consensus protocol starts, um, when the protocol starts, the network conditions are bad. And, you know, after some while, the network uh, uh, he, uh, gets healed. And then, um, you know, essentially we imagine let's say after the global stabilization time or GST, um, the, this uh, round trip condition is respected. Essentially every, honest, uh, every pair of honest nodes can talk to each other and make a round trip within a single second. Okay, so in practice, like you, you may wonder, so, so, so here there's actually a nice uh, modeling issue, right? So in practice, it could be the case that, you know, um, on day one, there's a period of synchrony. And then on day five, there's another period of synchrony. And then on day six, there's another period of synchrony. Like the period of synchrony can um, reoccur. Like it's not necessarily the, the case that there's a GST and afterwards it's going to be good forever, right? It could be, oh, it be, it's good for some time, it becomes bad, you know, that there's like some kind of a, a traffic jam, you know, now we're just a denial of service attack and, and then now it becomes bad. And then afterwards it becomes good again, right? Because the attack goes away. And then afterwards maybe it gets attacked again, it becomes bad again. So um, 
the reason why you know the model is essentially only a single GST and after GST it's good forever, right? Is because like essentially this model is like simple, but it kind of implies that every time it implies every time the network enters a good state and let's say that period of synchrony, if it's sufficiently long, then you'll make progress during that period. Like if you think about it, um, modeling GST once is like sufficient to actually capture every period of synchrony, like the progress in every period of synchrony. Okay, so uh, more precisely, what are we assuming about the GST? Uh, and what we are assuming is the following. So if an honest player observes the message in any round R, then all other honest players will have observed it at the beginning of, normally it should be R plus delta, right? But because like before GST, the network can be bad and no packets may be delivered, then we basically take the maximum of the two. In other words, informally speaking, as soon as GST starts, we are able to deliver um, messages, or if we are honest, we can um, send messages to one another in delta amount of time. And the epoch length is like two delta because the epoch, you, you need a round trip. So I, I send to you and you send, send back to me. So that's a round trip and that's like two delta. Okay, so that's just a, a little bit um, um, set up, right, about the modeling, like how we are capturing this notion of period of synchrony. It's, it's usually captured, you know, with, with the single GST and after GST, the network is good forever. Okay, so obviously, you know, the kind of theorem we can prove is that after GST, uh, there's going to be progress, right? Okay, so the, we are going to prove the following theorem. After GST, suppose that uh, something good happens. Now, what is this something good? Suppose there are five consecutive epochs, numbered E, E plus one, all the way to E plus four, and they all have honest leaders. In this case, you know, something good will happen um, at the beginning of epoch E plus five, every honest node must have grown its finalized chain by an honest block. Or, or more specifically, every honest player must have observed a new finalized block that was not yet finalized at the beginning of epoch E. So at the beginning of epoch E, I didn't see this block finalized, but after, um, you know, at the beginning of E plus five, it becomes finalized. So that's a new block that entered my finalized chain. And moreover, this newly finalized block must be proposed by an honest, honest node. So this is needed to make sure that um, liveness holds because when a, whenever an honest player proposes a block, it will incorporate all the outstanding transactions it has seen, right? If you are a corrupt player, you, you propose a block, the block can be empty or it can selectively censor some transactions. Like I, I don't want the transaction in there, so when I propose the block, I don't put it in there. However, whenever honest player proposes a block, it'll include all the outstanding transactions. So as long as you know, um, every now and then, the chain will grow by honest blocks, then we can get liveness, right? So what is live, remember what liveness says. Liveness says if I buy coffee, the transaction must appear in every honest player's log uh, fairly quickly in key confirmation time. Okay, um, so we are going to prove this together. And I think a natural question at this point is like, okay, why five epochs with honest leaders? Right? I mean, apparent, of course, if all the leaders are corrupt, then you cannot guarantee progress, right? Because the corrupt leaders can just drop, you know, the, this um, transaction. The corrupt leader doesn't want me to have coffee, maybe, you know, coffee, um, yeah. <laughs> Coffee is bad for your health. I don't know. I am sorry. I have I have a question. Um, yes. So in these five epochs, are we still assuming that like um, the synchrony still holds? Uh, yeah. So essentially, 
the model, that's a great question. So essentially the model assumes after GSC, synchrony always holds after GSC. Oh, okay, okay. So, so the, yeah, so again, the reason why the model is like, a more realistic model is like, okay, there, there are periods of synchrony, right? So like, let's say day one is a period of synchrony, day five is a period of synchrony, like it can come, come and go, right? It's not necessarily, okay, after day one, it'll be uh, synchrony forever. But th this, this modeling is without loss of generality because if you can prove, um, let's say, liveness um, after GSC, it kind of implies, let's say, you know, after GSC, liveness uh, can occur in T confirmation time. Then what this means is that um, as long as you have a period of synchrony, uh, that's T confirmation time long, you'll make progress during that period of synchrony. Like it, it doesn't matter if the period of synchrony comes and goes, like, you know, day one is period of synchrony, but you know, day one is at least T confirmation long. So, so you, if you imagine like they, the start of day one is GST, you know, it'll have made progress um, in day one. And then maybe it turns out, you know, after day one, an hour breaks again. And then when let's say day five starts, um, the network gets healed, right? So then, then we can treat like the beginning of day five as the new GST. And as long as that GST is long enough for the theorem, to, for the liveness theorem to, to hold, then it'll make progress again in day five. So that's why the modeling, like for simplicity, just chooses uh, this, this single point of time. And it pretends that after the single point of time, the network will be good forever. But that's like without loss of generality. Any other questions? So actually, uh, you know, one natural question is like, why five consecutive epochs, right? Because earlier, when we um, talked about the finalization rule, like it was three, right? As, lo as, as long as there are like three um, adjacent blocks with consecutive epoch numbers, we are going to um, make progress. Uh, we, sorry, we are going to have, um, you know, we, we chop off the last block, and you can finalize the prefix. So, so the natural question is like, okay, why is it five rather than three? Uh, I see some questions. It's not a question. Oh, okay. So intuitively the, the idea is like, um, you know, previously when the network conditions are bad or when the leaders have been corrupt, like there may be some bad effects remaining and in the beginning, right? So we cannot immediately start to um, contribute to this like three consecutive, right? We need to first undo the bad effects. That's kind of, um, you know, coming from the, the, the previous um, uh, corrupt leader or, you know, the time when the network is bad, then once we undo these bad effects, you enter some good state. And, you know, once you enter the good state, like whenever an honest leader proposes a block, everyone will vote on the proposal. And then, you know, when three of them um, are consecutive, right, in three consecutive epochs, they're all honest leaders, then we will have like, you know, six, seven, eight, like the, the good pattern that's um, required in the finalization rule. So you actually see this uh, in the proof as well, right? Why is it five rather than three? Any questions? Actually, the, the, this theorem statement is a little bit um, um, subtle too. Like, so right now it's not stated directly in the form of the liveness property, right? So it take, like given this, you have to do actually an extra step to get like a liveness in the form that we defined it. So another question is like, how often does this um, good condition happen, right? Like, you know, what if like, okay, there are around five epochs with honest leaders. Uh, and the point is like, in the last lecture, we learned that the leader election policy is random, right? Every epoch we pick a random leader. 
And because two thirds of the players are honest, like if you always pick a random leader, then with two thirds probability, the leader will be good, right? So, um, so there's essentially a constant probability that uh, five consecutive epochs will have all honest leaders. I mean, in fact, you can even have like a, a policy that says, you know, once you are elected, you act for like, you know, five epochs or something. Uh, it doesn't have to like change every epoch, right? So the, the simplest policy, of, of course, is like just elect random, a random every epoch, but you could also say, you know, once um, Ke is elected, she will be the leader for the next five epochs. And in this case, anytime an honest person is elected, you know, we expect some progress to be made. Wait, but if we do this, does that mean any dishonest leader, once they get elected, then um, their things will also be finalized? Their blocks will also be finalized? Dishonest, um, dishonest leaders, like there's no guarantee because if the leader is corrupt, like for instance, one thing it can do is just crash. Like it can fail to make a proposal and nothing will get confirmed during that epoch. And um, so like if indeed like one third of the players are corrupt and they're trying to hamper in progress, right? Like one thing they can do to maximally harm progress is like, I mean, maybe this is not maximally, like you can do more malicious things, but one thing you can do certainly is just you just stop proposing blocks altogether. And then like, essentially during your epochs, um, there's not going to be any progress, right? But still you cannot make sure, you know, you continue to control all the epochs because honest players are going to get elected leader because leader election is random. Um, so, but having said that, uh, like in this lecture, we're just going to focus on the simple random policy. It's actually possible to design uh, what I call the stability favoring policy, which is like, you know, if you are elected leader, you can, you know, kind of act for a longer term. I mean, it doesn't, have to be five epochs either. Like you can continue to be the leader um, for a longer period of time, let's say until you uh, misbehave and you know, until let's say progress stops and then people can re-elect leader. Or, or you can say, you know, you, you are going to act for the, the, this uh, whole day once you are elected and then, then the next day, next day we rotate to someone else. Um, so that could be, um, a more desirable policy if like um, you have a performance demanding scenario. Cause, cause like if you stick with the same leader, like when you implement the protocol, it's like uh, often easier to do like system level pipelining because the leader can pipeline. I, I can send a bunch of proposals all together. Um, uh, but if it's like, you know, every leader proposes one block, like sometimes you can, you know, depending on how you implement it, like the pipelining can be broken. broken. Okay, so we, we're just going to um, stick to the simple leader election policy and focus on doing the proof. Okay. So here's a very simple fact that we are going to rely on and it follows directly from this um, network delivery assumption, right? Also, by the way, what I want to mention is actually this network delivery assumption uh, also, it's like, uh, it assumes this implicit echoing behavior, which we mentioned last time, right? Essentially, if I observe some new message, I will propagate it to everyone else, right? If I haven't done so already. So, so like, the, the protocol doesn't uh, make that explicit, but, you know, essentially, we assume that this is something that the network layer is, is going to guarantee. So that's why if I observe something in round R, you will observe it in R plus delta, you know, after the GST. Okay, so given this um, network delivery assumption, we can um, have the following fact, right? If some honest player I has observed the notarization for a block B at the beginning of round R, it must be that, um, you know, after delta rounds, and suppose this after GST, then every honest node has observed the notarized chain ending at B. And this is just because, you know, if I observe it, I'm going to tell you, and you are going to observe it um, 
in the outer rounds after the Naur kills, after uh, GST starts. Oh, so another thing I want to mention is that like R can also be smaller than Delta. Like it could be, I send a message on day one and no one receives it. And then th on day five, uh, GST starts and then you are going to receive it. So like the message I sent on day one, like it can be delayed forever, but it's, it's not going to be lost. Like, you know, I, in some sense, when you implement a network layer, you're going to keep retrying until like the network kills. So, so R doesn't have to be like greater than GST or something. It can be sometime earlier. Okay, so how do we um, prove this theorem? So something that, you know, we might want to um, reason, like something that's nice, but actually it's not true, is the following, like, you know, suppose your, your first natural idea may be, okay, I want to prove that whenever it's after the GSC, an honest leader proposes a block, then all the honest players will sign this block. They will vote on the block. So is this, um, well, I've already told you it's not true, but I want, to, I want you to think about why this is something we actually cannot prove. I mean, if this, this is true, then it becomes very easy to prove, right? Because, you know, if honest leader proposes a block, everyone signs it, then we just need three of them to have liveness. But in fact, this is not true. And that's why we need like five consecutive um, epochs with honest leaders. Okay, so again, the question is, why is it not true? Uh, so I, let's say I claim um, after GST, if an honest leader proposes a block, everyone will vote on it. And that I already told you, this statement is false. And so can you try to like think of a scenario in which it's false? Yeah. Yes, Jun Si. Maybe like uh, when you propose it, because that's the first block after uh, the network is good. So people didn't see the node before the block you proposed. And if they didn't see the block before the one you proposed, they will not vote for this one. And is that okay? Yes, I, I think you, you get the idea. Um, we can like, we can work on this example a little bit more and maybe refine it, right? So, so Jinxi has um, a very good idea, right? So essentially, you know, when the GST has just begun, like, let's say I, I'm the first honest leader <coughs> after GST. And, and now I propose a block and I want you to <clears throat> vote on it. I mean, you're definitely going to receive the proposal in Delta round, right? So remember the epoch again, recall that the epoch length is two Delta, right? So <clears throat> I, I've said this, so it's enough to, like for the leader to make a proposal and for everyone to vote, right? Because that takes a round trip. It's not like a single Delta, it's two Delta. So if I'm honest, I propose a block, you'll receive it in Delta round <clears throat> after GST, Okay, so now are you going to vote on the block? I mean, of course, everyone's going to receive the proposal, but there, when people vote on the proposal, they will check if the proposal extends from one of the longest notarized chains they have seen. So one reason why they might not vote for it is because um, you know, the proposal doesn't extend from one of the longest notarized chains they have seen, right? So is it possible that you know, an honest leader will propose a let's say I, I'm honest, I propose a block, but Jinxi doesn't think it extends from like one of the longest notarized chains she has seen at the time she receives the proposal. So is that something like that potentially possible? So it's like if anyone received the uh, block before the new one you proposed, then I will no, I don't think that, like you. But that 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 basically means your node 
delivered before the previous one gets delivered to me. Um, what gets delivered? Can you? Um, oh, could we could we have them? like a block? So so let's say yeah. the uh the one you proposed has epic number seven seven. Yeah, let's draw an example. So let's say this this is what Elaine proposed. It has yeah. epic number seven. And it extends on something like maybe six. Let's say it extends from something that's six. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like I if I didn't receive six, then I will not vote for seven, right? Um, but if I like you, you will have received six for sure because if I have um if I have like observed um seven node if I'm proposing seven, right? I'm I have observed six notarized. The six is in the time when the network is not good, because starting from seven the network is good. No, but if I observe six notarized at the beginning of epoch E, let's say epoch E is after GST and it's the epoch in which I'm leader, then you'll okay. observe like, you'll observe uh, six in Delta rounds too, right? Because remember th this condition, th this condition like, this R can be smaller than GST. Like if, if it can be smaller than or equal to GST. Right? If I observe it before GST, you are going to observe it like in Delta rounds after GST anyway. Wait, so like if you observe it be even before the GST, then I would still observe it. I thought I thought that's that's like for after GST. Yeah, so this assumption is a little bit easier to work with. Like in some sense, it Im implicitly assumes the network, like when you implement the network layer of the consensus protocol, the network has implicit retrying, right? Because you know, it could be the network is badly partitioned. And in that case, I don't give up. I'm going to try to keep, um, you know, to keep retrying, uh, sending my message. Mm -hmm. So once the network does like um, this here, I mean, in something like let's say TCP, TCP, right? TCP has um, inside the network uh, protocol, like it has this retrying because if I don't hear act, like you can think of TCP, I send you a, a packet if I don't receive act from you, I will like have some kind of a timeout mm -hmm. and I will keep retrying until like uh, you send me some act. Um, so imagine it's like that, right? You can implement this retrying like in TCP, but you can also have like some other type of retrying because let's say your node uh, has crashed. Then in that case, when you restart the this consensus node, it also needs to like, essentially retry um, um, sending messages. So in fact, like if I have seen six and I propose seven, then in some sense you are going to see six very soon too, right? Because I must have like um, echoed six to everyone. So, so like, People will check if my block extends from one of the longest notarized chains they've seen. So the only reason why they might not vote for it is because, um, so let, let me just change the number to be smaller, to be safe, to make sure the scenario is possible. N not, not saying that six is impossible, like I just want to be, give an example that is, uh, that I know to be possible. Okay, let's say seven extends from four. And maybe like there's like five and six. So it could be like people have observed uh, six notarized at the time they received my proposal on seven. But the reason why I didn't extend from six, right? I mean, you might ask if people have seen the six notarized, why didn't I build my block here? I mean, it's quite possible that I haven't seen six yet. Like some people have seen six notarized, but I haven't when I made the proposal, right? So that's why I'm choosing to extend from four. Like if you think of uh, the timeline, let's say this is like, let's say the start of epoch E. 
and that, that's when I make the proposal, right? Um, so, so this is when I make the proposal. And maybe like, um, and let's say that this is like delta amount of time. And th by this time, people have seen my proposal. But it could be, um, let's say here, this is the time when many people voted on six, right? Let's say. So, okay, so basically, let's say people voted on six at this point of time. And then when I make the proposal, I haven't collected these votes on six yet. But um, let's say by the time people receive my proposal, they have like, they have heard all the votes on six. Um, if that's the case, then in this timeline, yeah. when will you, when, when is it possible for you to see uh, six being notarized? So, so let's say people vote on six at this point, then yeah. like the, then, then these notes will be on the wire and then let, let's say uh, I'm also going to assume like the, the startup epoch E, let's say this is exactly GST. And then because of the GST condition, if people <laughs> voted here, then like I, they will have received all the votes by the time they receive my proposal, right? Like, because there's Delta in between. So at this point, everyone has heard six notarized and they will no longer think uh, my proposal I is good. So that's also the time when you will hear six being notarized. Delta time yeah, but, after you make the proposal. Yeah, sure, but that's after I make the proposal because this is, let's okay. say, something, a very small duration, right? I mean, before the GST, it could be like the network conditions are bad. I mean, even if like six may be an honest leader, like it could be, I mean, normally people shouldn't be voting on this six like towards the end of epoch six right I maybe mean, because this is getting very very close to epoch epoch seven sorry when i say epoch e maybe i should just say epoch seven right because we're, we have concrete numbers here okay so normally people shouldn't be voting on the proposal you know towards the end of epoch six but because like you know before the gst it could be the narrow conditions are bad and the, you know, even though the leader of Epoch 6 is honest, like it could be his proposal uh, took longer to transmit and people voted on 6 like towards the end of 6, that, that's possible. I mean, it could also be like just let's say the 6th leader is, uh, the leader of Epoch 6 is corrupt and he didn't send the proposal at the beginning of Epoch 6, right? And uh, it only sent the proposal towards the end of epoch six. That's also possible. So, but this example is just to show, I mean, there's, in some sense, there's no guarantee. Like even after GST, there's no guarantee. Like if I vote for some, if I propose some block, I can convince everyone to vote on it, right? Because had that been true, then liveness would be like really simple to prove. So unfortunately that's not true. So like, what can we say about, um, this protocol after GST. So that there are something, there are some nice things that we can say. And the first nice thing we can say is the following. And then we were just going to basically collect all these nice things we can say about the protocol's behavior after GST and also like under honest leaders. And when we look at uh, these good properties, we'll realize actually, you know, liveness uh, will hold. Okay, so, so just jumping ahead a little bit before I um, tell you how to prove it, right? So what I'm actually going to prove is that if there are three consecutive epochs, all with honest leaders, let's say epoch seven, eight, and nine, they all have honest leaders. As we said, we cannot guarantee that the proposal made by uh, 
the seventh leader will get voted on. Um, we may not be able to make sure that the proposal uh, made by the eighth leader will get voted on. However, I will show you that I can guarantee you that the proposal made by the ninth leader, the third one in the consecutive row, right? If you have like, you know, just a streak of good luck, the third try is like, you know, the lucky try. Third time is the best. And then this person's proposal will indeed get voted on by all of the honest players. And that's why, you know, if you have five, starting here, you can have the nice property that people will vote on the honest person's proposal. And then once you have nine, 10, 11, you'll have three in a row, right? And you can trigger the finalization rule and finalize, it, finalize new blocks. Okay, so in some sense, like at a very, very high level, this is saying, you know, in the beginning, um, there may be some bad effects, right? When seven and eight, they're proposing blocks, there are some bad effects left and their proposal may not get voted on, but I mean, at least they help to undo the bad effects. And when all the, the bad effects are undone, you know, um, we have the third try. Uh, third try is, uh, you know, a, a charm, right? You succeed and then everything will be good afterwards. Okay. So that's what we want to prove. Uh, so to prove something like that, um, we want to establish like some good properties. And the first uh, such good property is the following. So let's call this, um, I I'm going to call this uh, fact. Um, do we have any number? Okay. This is fact two. And let's say th this is fact one. Okay, so now I can call this fact three. Suppose that <coughs> after GST, there are two epochs E and E plus one, both with honest leaders. Uh, so let's denote them as LE and LE plus one respectively. And suppose that LE and LE plus one proposed blocks at lengths L zero, and this is little L, little L one, respectively in epochs E and E plus one. Maybe I should say in epochs E and E plus one respectively. So in this case, we can conclude the following must be true. It must be that L1 is greater than or equal to L0 plus one. So one thing we can, this is like saying, if we have two consecutive honest leaders after GST, one thing we can say at the very least is that the second person is going to like, you know, propose at a greater length. Like it cannot just, it cannot be that, you know, the second proposal is like still at the same position or same height as the first one. Um, so when I say length, I also mean height, right? This, this means it's like the, maybe let me just call it height. And height means like the, essentially the 
offset from the Genesis block. Um, so essentially, if this is the Genesis block, like th this one is like height three, this is uh, height two, but well, depending on whether you count the Genesis. So if, if like you don't count the Genesis, then this would be height one, this would be height two, and the Genesis is like, let's say at height zero. Okay. So th this just means, okay, the next proposal is going to be longer, at least be longer than the, the previous proposal. And it turns out like with th this condition being true, I, I can later show you that essentially, you know, the, the third try will succeed. Cause, cause you know, th this is the first try, it may not succeed, but at least it makes sure the second try will um, be at a greater uh, height. And then the third try must be at a yet, yet a greater height. And um, if this continues, like, you know, you cannot, in some sense, the adversary cannot um, make sure that th this bad scenario happens, continues to happen. Like, because here it happens because I, I proposed seven, because I didn't see six, like, you know, when I made the proposal, but however, when people receive my proposal, they've seen six notarized. So this bad scenario can happen, let's say a couple of times, but it just, it cannot continue to happen. Like you cannot sustain it um, no matter what you do. Okay, so how do you prove something like this? So essentially we can go back to this example and this example almost gave a proof, right? I mean, essentially there are two scenarios, right? The good scenario is, okay, I propose seven and everyone just votes on seven. And if that's the case, of course, the, the next honest leader will propose, um, will essentially build on this notarized block seven, right? Because if everyone votes on seven, it'll get notarized in every honest player's view by the beginning of the next epoch. And then the next honest leader will just like propose the block here. So that's like the, you know, the perfect scenario. But even in the bad scenario, like it's not so bad after all, right? Because in the bad scenario, people didn't vote on seven because they saw six notarized. And if they saw six notarized by the time they're supposed to vote for seven, it means at the beginning of the next epoch, like, every honest leader, every honest player will see six notarized too. So like the worst case that can happen is that the next leader proposes a block uh, from here, right? So regardless, in either case, the next proposal is going to be at least longer. Like if it may not build upon my proposal, like seven may not get notarized, but at least, at least the, you know, one thing I can say is that next proposal will be longer. So the proof is just like essentially writing down what I had said. So first, um, like at the beginning of round delta into epoch E, So, so I, I'm going to assume that the, the first epoch of, uh, first round of epoch e is numbered epoch zero, right? So I can count, you know, start the first epoch e in epoch zero, I'm going to count till the, the round delta into epoch e. And at the beginning of that round, by our, you know, network assumption, right? The GST um, network delivery assumption, every, honest player will have observed this honest leader's proposal and 
so say th th this proposal is a block B at height um, L0. Moreover, the parent chain of B that triggered LE to propose B, right? I mean, the honest leader will build its proposal extending from the longest notarized chain it has seen. So at the time LE makes a proposal for B, it must have observed B's parent uh, notarized. <clears throat> so this um, parent chain that triggered the proposal, like the, its notarization will also have been observed by every honest player Delta runs into the epoch. So this must have uh, been observed by every honest player at the beginning. of um, round delta into epoch E. So actually not just the parent chain, but also its notarization and its notarization. Okay, so, so because, you know, everyone has, um, observe the new proposal as well as, you know, the parent chain that triggered the proposal. Uh, really, you know, the decision whether I'm going to vote for it, like boils down to whether I've observed another notarized block at the same length of B, right? So there are two cases. Case one is um, So let's say in case one, at least one honest player, I has observed a conflicting notarized chain also of the same height by round delta into epoch E in this case um, we can conclude by the beginning of epoch E plus one every honest player including the next leader <clears throat> must have seen a notarized chain of a height L, L0. So this means like the next leader will just kind of uh, will propose if, if it makes a proposal, it has to, you know, be at length at least L0 plus one, right? So case one is actually, as I said, is actually, you know, the, the bad case. I mean, case two is even better. Case two, just, you know, if no, um, in case two, this is not true. So if, let's say this is not true, then 
essentially all honest players will vote for our East proposal. And uh, in essentially um, by you know in some sense by the end of round delta into apple T. And then essentially this implies by the beginning of the uh, the next epoch because the epoch length is two delta, right? So by the beginning of epoch E plus one, every honest player has seen uh, be notarized. Okay, so essentially in both cases, the next uh, leader LE plus one will propose uh, something at height uh, at least L zero plus one. Okay, so, so this is a fact that says, you know, if there are two consecutive, then one thing we can say for sure is that the, the proposal's height will grow, right? It cannot be that the second person is like, you know, still proposing at the same height or even shorter height, right? So, so I mean, in, in a sense, we are kind of making some progress, right? I mean, because at, at the very least, the height is growing, but it turns out, you know, with this good uh, property, we can prove that the, the third try is the is charm. Okay. Okay, so now we are going to prove what I said. Um, well, this is like what I said, the third try is charm, it'll work. So more, more precisely after GST, suppose an um, apex E, E plus one, E plus two, all have honest leaders. Then we can conclude that the following holds. Um, so let me denote uh, this block. Uh, let B be the block proposed in the third try, right? Proposed by LE plus two in epic E plus two. So then the following must be true. <clears throat> By the beginning of epoch E plus three, every honest player will observe A notarized chain ending at B. Oh, and also notice that B was not notarized before the beginning of Epoch E.
And number two, we can guarantee that no conflicting block B prime, which is not the same as B at the same height, as B will ever get notarized in the union of honest players' views, so in honest view. Okay, so during the third try, we indeed have the very nice property that um, everyone's just going to vote on the honest proposal B, so B is going to get notarized before the end of the epoch, before the end, before the end of the epoch, which is also the beginning of epoch E plus three. And not only so, there cannot be a conflicting block that ever gets notarized at the same height as B. So, okay, so let's think about, before I prove this, right? If this were true, then we get liveness with five, consecutive uh, honest leaders after GST. And why is that the case, right? Because um, if this is indeed true, you know, number one, the next leader will propose um, some block whose, um, whose height is at least the height of B plus one, right? Because it will have seen B notarized by the time it makes a proposal. And then because of B, there cannot be any other block getting notarized at the same height as B. The only possible proposal for me to make, if the height is greater than B, like the only choice I have is to build on top of B. So if these two things hold, we can conclude the next honest proposal will propose a block building exactly on top of B. And then, you know, then, then we just apply this again, right? inductively, and then the ne next next proposal proposer will build on top of the block proposed by its predecessor. So, so at this moment, really, we are, you know, in a very good state and essentially things are just like what you should expect, right? You know, I make a proposal, everyone votes on it, and it gets notarized, the next leader builds on top of my block, makes a proposal, everyone votes on it, and then after three epochs, we trigger the finalization rule. Um. What do you mean by like in the lemma in part A, and it says like um, and B was not notarized before the beginning of epoch E. B was proposed at E plus two, right? Yeah, I just this is just this is something that that should be trivial to prove. Like you can think about it yourself. Like I I only added this because the Leibniz theorem says you know what does it um what does what does it count right? When does it count to have Leibniz? Um, not only do we have uh, have to like, so, so when do we make progress, right? If at some point we are finalizing new blocks, then that counts as progress, right? So like not, not only, um, like the Le Leibniz theorem says that we want to make sure that there's a new block entering the finalized uh, chain. And what does it mean for it to be new? New means it was not finalized earlier, but now it becomes finalized and that, that must be new, right? So, so this is just like making sure, you know, th this block was not, was not finalized earlier because uh, it's actually finalized now. Just, just to make sure it's new. And the fact that that's true should be like, um, should be pretty straightforward. Okay, uh, so, so like when you say B was not notarized, do you mean like B was not finalized? Wait, no, I mean, if, if it's not if it's not uh, notarized, it cannot be finalized. Right? But B was not even proposed. Well, that's why. I mean, because like B has uh, epoch E. I mean, there's no way for people to vote on it if they haven't entered that epoch, right? So this is just a trivial fact. If you okay. if you're not in epoch okay. E yet, no no block of like epoch E. If epoch E is in the future, no block of epoch E can get finalized because you do need a bunch of votes from honest players to finalize to to notarize anything, right? So if E is in the future, no block of epoch E can get notarized. So that, that's just stating that fact. And the only reason why the sentence is here is because like later on when we want to translate these properties to liveness, I want to make sure the blocks that are getting notarized, right? we want three consecutive no, uh, epochs. 
um, appearing together to trigger the finalization rule, I want to make sure these are actually newly notarized uh, blocks and not like previously notarized blocks. So it, it is like something uh, that's straightforward to see. In the future or in the past? Because we're here in E plus three, right? Well, B is actually, um, B is of applic E plus two, right? Let B be the block uh, proposed by okay. th uh, this leader. So, so applic E plus two is in the future of applic, right? before applic E, applic E plus two must be in the future, right? So before applic E, there's no way any block of applic okay. E plus two is notarized. Okay, okay. Yeah, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so yeah, so let's now do the proof together. So what do I want to prove here? So first, um, like we can conclude, okay, we had this fact, right? We are going to use this fact somehow, fact three. Fact three if, says if you have two consecutive after, uh, two consecutive honest leaders after GST, the proposed height must grow. Okay, so proposed height must grow means uh, like, let's just write it down. We, ha we have to use this um, at some point. So by fact three, we have that L2 is greater than L1, which is greater than L zero. So that we can be sure. Um, okay. So uh, I guess I define L zero. Okay, maybe I didn't define it. Okay, so let's say. Um, let L zero little L zero little L one little L two be the height of the blocks proposed by LE, LE plus one, LE plus two in apex E, E plus one and E plus two respectively. So this is just like some notation. Okay. And then we can say, you know, by fact three, th these heights must grow, right? And in some sense, we are making so some kind of progress, right? It may not be the kind of progress we want yet, but some progress is good. And we can translate that into the progress we want it to be. Okay, so we know that actually this block B proposed by uh, the, the third leader, our E plus two, right? So that one is actually at the height L2. <clears throat> okay, so we prove that by the beginning of epoch E plus three, no honest player signed a conflicting block B prime, which is not the same as B, uh, at the same height as B. Okay, so why do we want to prove this? If it's the case that, you know, no one has voted for a conflicting block at the same height as B, then it means that people will, like we want to show that people will indeed vote on B, right? During epoch E plus two. And if we can show, you know, by the beginning of epoch E plus three, there cannot be another block uh, notarized in honest view at the same height as B, then it guarantees that people will definitely vote 
vote for B in APEC E plus two. Because the only reason for me not to vote on it, again, the only reason for me not to vote on it is if it doesn't extend from one of the longest notarized chains I've seen, which means there must be like a conflicting block at the same height of the proposal, right? If there's nothing notarized at the height of the proposal, I will definitely vote on that proposal. Okay, so to prove this, so how do you prove something like this? Well, why don't you think about it uh, yourself and, and see if you can prove it? So does anyone want to like try to prove this? Uh, so in both cases discussed earlier, um, the block proposed by the honest LE plus one would be notarized. So we, we don't know that, right? We, 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 right? right now, we don't have any guarantee at all that the block proposed by the honest leader will get notarized. Right? But that's something we're trying to prove. Right? We're saying, oh, the first try, we, we show, show the counter example, like the first try mm -hmm. may not be good. The second try, we don't know. And in fact, I don't think it's true for the second try either. Um, but that now we, we are saying, you know, third time is the charm. So the third try, like we don't have the guarantee that the second proposal will get voted on. Because that, that's exactly where, what we are trying to establish right now. But I mean, remember, we are going to use fact three, right? So, so like one thing we know for sure is that like, okay, the proposed height must grow. So if there's a notarized block uh, B prime at the same height as B that got notarized by the beginning of epoch E plus three, right? Like the one question you can ask, could B prime be the block that was proposed by L1 and L2? I'm oh, sorry, L1 and L0. The, yeah, the, the leader um, LE and LE plus one. No. Nope. Right, exactly right. Because, because of fact three, B prime could not have been proposed by like the first two honest proposers. So now, you know, for, for this B prime to get notarized, some honest players must have voted for it, right? Um, so when, when could they have voted for it? Like, can they have voted for it in epoch E and E plus one, right? In the first two of these epochs? We know that they're not proposed by L0 and L1. I mean, L, they're not proposed by the first two honest leaders, uh, which is LE and LE plus one. So they are proposed before the first leader. Well, yeah, it doesn't matter when they are proposed. Like they, they could not, honest notes could not have voted for them in, yeah. in the first of these, uh, first two of these three epochs, right? In epoch E and E plus one, they're only going to vote on things proposed by the the epoch leader so in epoch e i will look for a proposal by uh, le in epoch e plus one i will look for a proposal by leader uh, l e plus one right i will look for the corresponding leader so if i voted for b prime and b prime is not proposed by l e or l e plus one i could not have voted for them in these two epochs so i must have voted for it even earlier so if I had voted, voted for this B prime even earlier, what does that mean? Like I, I must 
what does it take for me to vote on B prime? I saw a parent. Yeah, so I, I saw the parent notarized, and the par parent is at like height L2 minus one, right? Yeah. So if I saw something at L2 minus one notarized, um, even before Epoch E started, then then the first then the first pro yeah I, I think you are getting the I idea then then what can I conclude like you know some honest players are some height l l two minus one notarized very early on. So, so now if I know it's like when will you know it? Because just like just he let's say started definitely, you know, um no later than the start of effort E. Yeah. So can can like you know the first of these three leaders, L E can L E propose something at Le, uh, height L0, can LE plus one propose something at height L1, right? I mean, notice like someone has, some honest player has observed L2 minus one notarized very, very early on. So like, you know, L0 and LE and LE plus one will also observe it um, like pretty soon after the SD. What do you think? Can we like reach a contradiction here? Yeah, so like if uh, if a block at height L2 minus one is notarized very, uh, like earlier before the E, uh, before epoch E, then mm -hmm. at the beginning of epoch, at least epoch A plus one, LE plus one would not um, propose a block at height L1 that is uh, mm -hmm. less than L2. Yeah, very good, right? So that is, so exactly as what Kerr said, we want to reach a contradiction to say if someone has observed like, you know, an, a block notarized at L2 minus one very early on, it cannot be the case that the second leader proposed a block at L1 because, you know, you, you must have observed something notarized at um, L2 minus one by the time it makes a proposal, right? Okay, so that has to be true if you think about it, like if you think about the network delivery assumption we are making. Okay, so, so let me just write down um, the proof we just said, right? We had talked it over, um, but um, I'll write everything down now. Okay, so the first thing we want to conclude um, is that if there's a conflicting block B prime that notarized, got notarized before like the beginning of epoch E plus three, we may conclude um, that by fact three, B prime cannot be proposed by by LE and LE plus one. So for B prime, for B prime to be notarized some honest player must have voted for it. I star must have voted for B prime, but you know this I star cannot have voted for it in epoch E and E plus one.
And this is just because th this block was not proposed by LERLE plus one, right? I mean, in honest players, like I'm only going to listen to this Apex leader. So if B prime was not proposed by LE and LE plus one, then honest player cannot have voted for it uh, in these epochs. So we can conclude, you know, I star must have voted for it like very early on before epoch E started. Okay, so, so this means I star observed um, a notarized chain of uh, height L2 minus one before epoch E started. And now by our uh, network delivery assumption after GST, we can conclude that all honest players, including our E plus one must have observed a notarized chain of height L2 minus one at the beginning of epoch E plus one. So we can conclude L E plus one cannot have proposed a block at height L E L one. Okay. So like with this, we are essentially almost done, right? Because you know, as I said, because like no one has seen a conflicting B prime notarized at the same height as B before the beginning of uh, epoch E plus three, this immediately implies everyone's going to vote on B, right, during epoch um, E plus two, and then everyone will have heard the notarization at the beginning of like epoch E plus three, and then this actually also shows that like we have two bullets, right? That also actually implies that B must be true as well. So now if both are true, as I explained, when you enter the next epoch, the next leader will build um, its proposal upon the predecessor's uh, proposal, right? And then inductively this good state will just continue. And after three more epochs, you know, we have to trigger the finalization rule and everyone will be finalizing new blocks proposed by the honest leader. Okay, so we are exactly on time. Like I'm not going to write down the rest of the proof, but essentially the rest of the proof um, should be fairly straightforward at this point. Okay. So I, I guess, Starting from the ne next lecture, right? So in fact, I didn't use the term partially synchronous very much, but in fact, Streamlit is a partially synchronous protocol exactly because the consistency doesn't depend on our timing assumptions, but liveness, you know, only uh, follows during periods of synchrony. So in the next lecture, we are going to prove um, in such a model called the partially synchronous model, one third is the best resilience you can tolerate. Like essentially, if the adversary controls at least one third of the players or more, you cannot hope to build consensus 
um, in the partially synchronous network. So Streamlit actually has optimal resilience in this sense. Okay, I guess um, if you have questions, I can stay a little longer. Otherwise, I'll see you on Thursday. Um, so I have one question. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, I, uh, so uh, you just mentioned that in the asynchronous model, you can't do better than one third, but isn't it sufficient to say that even in the synchronous model, you can't do better than one third, so as asynchronous uh, automatically follows from that? So the dolaf strom protocol we learned at the beginning of the semester can tolerate arbitrarily many faults, right? Even if it's like, you know, up, it's like two, right? Uh, but Byzantine broadcast um, cannot, right? We, the dolaf strom solves Byzantine broadcast problem, right? We define Byzantine broadcast during the same lecture as we talked about dolaf strom. Uh, and we learned that Byzantine broadcast can be used to build uh, state machine replication, which is blockchain. Oh, okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. so, so the lower bound doesn't hold in, obviously, in, in a synchronous model because, I mean, you, you'll see the proof obviously doesn't hold. I mean, but, but there's also, we, we know of constructions that tolerate arbitrarily many faults uh, if the network is synchronous. If the consistency proof is also allowed to depend on synchronous assumptions, Okay, in the synchronous case, it doesn't hold uh, if you don't allow for like PKI. That's the. Yeah, that's, that, that's the point, right? If you don't have PKI, you can only tolerate one third, okay. even in the synchronous model, right? That's a very good point. So that's lower bound we also learned. It's a hexagon, remember, not a triangle. Right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right, I'll see you on Thursday then.